Take your uh, Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. Your Bibles, your uh, iPhone, your iPad, whatever you have scripture on today, will be in Philippians chapter 2, the latter part of Philippians 2. Since the beginning of the year, we have been uh, uh, talking about our theme for this year, which is you can see it up in the banners on both sides of the auditorium live generously. And that's the goal for our ministry this year. We want to be a, a ministry, a church that generously demonstrates the love of Jesus Christ. And we've fleshed that out so far in three ways. The first message of the year, we talked about the fact that to live generously means to demonstrate unity. And we try to be really practical, talking about the fact that at some point during this year, you're going to have a trial. At some point during this year, I'm going to have a, a tribulation. And it's during those moments, Paul says, that we need each other. That, that's when unity really becomes necessary in our lives. And the Apostle Paul talked about that. Paul then showed us that living generously means to demonstrate humility. And we talked about humility basically is, is treating someone else as more significant than ourself. Looking out not for our own interests, but looking out for the interests of others. And we saw Paul gave us the greatest example of that in verses five through 10, where he lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ, and he tells us to have the same mind as Christ. And we know that Jesus demonstrated supreme humility by coming to earth, taking on the form of a human, the form of a servant, and then sacrificing himself for us. Last week, Pastor Brad talked about the fact that to live generously means that you and I are on mission. The fact that, that, that we have a, a job, a responsibility, a mission that God has called us to. We don't simply come to church and sit in a seat on Sunday morning and walk out and think, okay, I've fulfilled my spiritual responsibility for the week. Now we come here to have our batteries energized so that we might go out in the world and shine, as Paul said, shine as lights in the midst of darkness. And so I trust this last week that, that you were able to put that in practice. You look for ways to be a light, a shining light of Jesus Christ in the lives of others. Today we're going to look at three more verses down towards the end of the chapter and make what I believe is a very practical application for us today. And so if you're in Philippians chapter 2, I'd like to read just three or four verses Philippians 2, 19, I'll put it up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Paul says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Paul says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned about your welfare. I find it very interesting. That's the theme that Paul has been talking about, not worried about ourselves, but looking for the welfare of someone else. And here, Paul lifts up Timothy saying, here's a man who is not concerned about his own welfare, but he will be generally concerned about your welfare, he tells the Philippians. For all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Let me pause. If there's a verse that characterizes the day and age in which we live, is there a more apropos verse than that? Everyone seeks their own interests and not that of Jesus Christ. Paul says, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you for the, the wonderful time of worship that we've been able to experience today. And Lord, uh, our, our prayer is that not only in song by the notes that were played and the way we sang with our voices, but even more importantly with the condition of our hearts that Jesus has been lifted up and honored and glorified. We realize there's only one person here today that is worthy of honor and praise and glory and that's Jesus Christ, and we honor him today. 
And so, Lord, as we uh, um, kind of have a family conversation today, I pray that you would help us to, uh, to realize very practical ways that we can live out the truth that Paul is conveying in this chapter, to live generously, to look at others as more significant, more important than ourself. Help us to understand that today. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God would take the truth of everything that's being said and drive it home personally to our hearts and to our minds. We submit ourselves to you today. We surrender ourselves to you today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so today I kinda wanna personalize the message that we have been talking about the last three weeks. So, so, so here's the question I wanna talk about. What does it mean for Hollywood Community Church to be humble? What does it mean for Hollywood Community Church to be united and for all of us to be on mission? I would remind you, and we have to start with our mission statement. I know what we say this all the time, and we think everybody knows it, but I'm not sure that everybody does. The mission statement of Hollywood Community Church is three simple phrases. Glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. Would you say that with me today? Glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. Okay, we'd do it again. That was about a third of you. All right, I want you to get it. So our church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. So now what we're doing is everything we do, we are filtering through that mission statement. Someone comes and says, Brian, I got a, I got a great idea. We want to have a, a bowling league or, or whatever. Uh, we sit back and say, okay, how is that going to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others? That's our mission. That's what we believe that God has called us to do here in the city of Hollywood. That is the mission and the goal that drives us. How do we do that, though? What does that look like at Hollywood Community Church? And so I kind of want to flesh out that mission and kind of go just a step further and give you a vision statement. By the way, it's, uh, it, it's our mission that drives our vision. So our mission is glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. But here's our vision. I want to put it up on the screen and I want you to see it. Here's our vision. Hollywood Community Church is determined to be a multicultural, multi-generational church that is dedicated to build and transform our community by living out the truth of the gospel. So in other words, we wanna, we wanna take that mission of glorifying God, making disciples and serving others, and we wanna flesh that out in a palpable way, a game plan, a strategy, as it were, for us to really make a difference in our community. And so we fleshed it out this way again. We are determined to be a multicultural, multi-generational church that is dedicated to build and transform our community by living out the truth of the gospel. Let me just take just a few minutes and pull out a few of those phrases. First of all, I'm gonna start at the back end. So, so as a church, we wanna build and transform our community. In other words, here's what we want. We want the city of Hollywood to be different, to be better because we are here. In other words, to say it this way, if the only people that are being affected by this ministry are those of us that are here this morning, then we're really not making a difference in our community. And so we want to be transformational. We want our neighbors to know that we're here, and we want our community to know that we're here because we are making a difference in our community. And so we've determined to do that through, uh, through various aspects. Obviously, our, our food pantry. Our food pantry is serving hundreds of people each and every week. And by the way, we'll, we'll present you the award next week. But this last week, our, our food pantry was given an award. We were given the Community Advocate Award by the Florida Guardian Ad Litem Program for the difference that we are making in families in our community through our food pantry. We're committed to doing that. 
We're committed to doing that through social programs as well. We're working, secondly, on, on education initiatives. We're realizing that one of the greatest needs in our community is education, and so we're working on some education and initiatives, partnering, obviously, with our school, Hollywood Christian School, and partnering with other schools in the area to make a difference in our community. We're also forming other area partnerships with churches and community leaders so that we can really make a difference here. We're committed, we're determined to do that. We're also determined to be multicultural. We realize that we live in a very multi-ethnic, multicultural society, do we not? You and I can go to Walmart, we can go to anywhere, and there's all kinds of different languages that are being spoken to us. We have people uh, coming here from all over the world. So we want to have a church that represents those different communities. We don't want to be a monocultural church in a multicultural society. We want to be the opposite of that. We want Hollywood Community Church to reflect the many cultures that exist in our community. And if you look around our auditorium, we are that. And so here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make that a reality, not only in the congregation, but we're striving to make that a reality in our leadership. So we're making sure that our leadership, our, our staff, and our lay leadership is a reflection of our community. You sit back and say, Brian, why, why would you do that? Why is that important? Because that's important to Jesus. And by the way, we mentioned before, that's what heaven is going to look like. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 says that heaven will be made up from people from every nation, every language, every tongue. That's what heaven is going to look like. Don't we want to experience just a piece of heaven here at Hollywood Community Church? Of course we do. And so we are, we are determined to be multicultural. The third thing that our vision statement says is this. We are determined to be multigenerational, to be inter generational. Now, let me be frank today. That's probably where we're not doing a very good job at Hollywood Community Church. I get it. I get it. I know sometimes I, I try to dress young. You see me in skinny jeans. Brad tries to put skinny jeans on me, and, and I untuck my shirt, and, and I try to look young, but the simple fact is this. I'm 55 years old. Yesterday, I received in the mail a renewal for my AARP membership, <laughs> all right? And so it doesn't matter how young I try to look, it doesn't matter how young I try to be, the reality is that what? I am 55 years old, I can't change that. They say that a pastor generally reaches 10 years down and 10 years up. And so they would say that a pastor of my age would generally reach people between 45 and 65. And for the most part, when you look out across our congregation, that is a large majority of who our church is. I get that because, because we relate with one another. But, but here's what I'm saying today, church. I'm saying that we need to do a better job of reaching the younger generation with the gospel. The future of Hollywood Community Church depends on us doing that. And so today I kind of want to have a, a family conversation. Can we do that today? And I want to share some things that are on my heart today. And not only my heart, our, our elder board, we've spent time praying about this. We've spent time talking about it. Our pastoral staff has spent some time praying and talking about this. And so I just want to kind of have a conversation about maybe what we can do better to reach a younger generation. And so I've given you just a few notes. I'm, I'm gonna try not to preach today. It's hard for a preacher not to preach, but I'm gonna try not to. I just wanna share my heart with you today. And so if you have that outline in front of you, I wanna see, uh, I want you to see the very first point that I put, because I think this is, the, this gives clarity to what we're trying to accomplish. And, and I put them on the outline and we'll put it up on the screen. I said this, the spiritual success of this generation is measured, not completely, but is measured by its ability to pass on its faith 
to the next generation. Let me say that again. The spiritual success, that's not an all-inclusive statement, but the spiritual success of this generation is measured by its ability to pass on its faith to the next generation. All of us want our families to grow beyond us, right? I mean, as a family, we want the Burkholders to keep on growing. When Vicki and I pass from the scene, we want there to be somebody else that, that comes from us that, that carries on the Burkholder name. That's just a natural desire to do that. You want your family to continue. And what we're simply saying today is this. We want Hollywood Community Church to exist and to thrive and to make a difference in our community beyond my time here and beyond your time here. In a very real sense, the success of our ministry will be measured by our ability not just to reach this generation, but our ability to reach the next generation. Let that sink in for just a second. We can have large crowds. We can have large programs. But if we're not reaching our kids, if we're not reaching our grandkids for Jesus Christ, are we truly succeeding in what we're doing? There's a, there's a story, there's actually a part of the Old Testament that talks about that. Let, let me read a couple of verses from Judges chapter two. Judges chapter two is the book of Judges begins um, uh, the writer of Judges makes a, a, a very poignant, a very powerful statement about this generation. I'll put it up on the screen, follow along. It says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. How many of you are familiar with Joshua? All right. You know, we know jo Joshua led the battle of Jericho, right? This guy was a success. And so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua under Joshua's leadership. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all of the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. But then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, as all of us will. He died at the age of 110. They buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Notice this phrase, in my opinion, one of the saddest phrases, most tragic phrases in all of Scripture. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. I read that and think, how is that? Joshua's generation was the most successful generation in the history of Israel. Think with me, all of the great miracles that they had seen. They had seen God rescue them from Egypt. You remember the story. They had seen God part the waters of the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry land, and then the Egyptians came after them, and they stood on the banks, the Bible says, and they looked back and watched the Egyptian army being destroyed. They walked into the wilderness and for 40 years, they experienced God meeting their needs. Every morning they woke up and there was manna on the ground. God miraculously provided for them. They had seen Moses walk up to Mount Sinai and they had seen Moses come down with the Ten Commandments. And then they entered into the land of Canaan and they saw that that unbelievable victory over the city of Jericho. You know the story where they marched around it for seven days, and on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, and they saw the walls fall flat. Joshua's generation maybe experienced more miracles, more demonstration of God's power than any other generation. But here's where they failed. They failed to pass that belief on to their kids. Because it says that the next generation did not know the Lord, nor did that next generation know the works that God had done. By all measurable means, Israel under Joshua's leadership was a success. But when Joshua passed away, and when Joshua's 
contemporaries passed away, the next generation did not know God. So I sit back and think, how does that apply to us? How does that apply to you and me as parents? Can I give you some really practical things today? If you're following along, I I wrote this down in, in my notes, and I want to take just a second to talk to moms and dads and potential moms and dads and and grandmas and grandpas. Because what I wrote down in my notes is this. As parents, your number one priority is to lead your kids to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. That is so important. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, your number one priority is to lead your kids to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. To make them into disciples of Jesus is more important than a good education. I'm I'm not saying your kids shouldn't get a good education. We're all about that here at Hollywood Community Church and Hollywood Christian School. But, But making sure your kids love Jesus that they're gonna follow in your footsteps is more important than a good education. Making sure your kids love Jesus and follow Jesus is more important than them participating in sports. It's more important than them being star athletes. And I'm not opposed to any of those things. Look at me, look how athletic I look. I mean, I mean I'm not opposed to any of that, all right? But, but it's more important than even getting them into a good college. Can I be honest as a pastor? I'm afraid that as Christian parents, we've got off track. I'm afraid that as Christian parents, we've, we've, we've lost it somewhere. We've gotten off track. We're preparing our kids well for this life, but we're not preparing our kids well for the life to come. And you say, oh, come on, Brian, you're exaggerating. I'm going to share some statistics with you today that are absolutely startling about how we are losing this generation as believers. And so moms and dads, I want you to catch this today. Your number one priority is to lead them to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. The writer of Proverbs says it this way, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he or she is older, they will not depart from it. So can I give you, this isn't even in your notes, this is free. Let me give you a a couple of practical ways that you can do that, mom and dad. Can I do that? Just a couple of really practical ways. And they're alliterated, you know me, they're alliterated so you can remember them. The first is this, be real. Be real. Here's what I'm saying, moms and dads. You, you, you have to be consistent. You have to live out what you believe. To, today's youth can detect hypocrisy from a mile away. They, the, they have like this, you know, the, this hypocrisy radar. They have the ability to do that. And if they see mom and dad, or if they see their church, or if they see their pastor, if they see people that are presenting themselves as spiritual leaders that act one way at church, but act another way at home, that just sets off all kinds of alarms for them. And that just makes them say, you know what, why am I going to be a part of something that's not real? Mom and dad act like it's real on Sunday, but on Monday, man, they live however they want. I mean, they, they use all the Christian terminology at church, but man, at home, you wouldn't believe the words that fly out of mom and dad's mouth. Our kids see that. Our kids detect that. It is so important for us to be real. The very best thing that you can do for your kids is to be genuine. I don't say perfect, all of us fail. Good grief, we all blow it, do we not? There's times we're gonna blow up, there's times we're gonna respond incorrectly, but man, when that happens, be humble. Apologize to your son or your daughter. Let them know, man, you know what? Man, Justin, Mark, I'm sorry, because I acted this way, and, and, 
That's not the way your dad should act. And I just gave a terrible testimony for you. And so please forgive me. Be real. Live out the truth of the gospel. And by the way, the only way that you and I can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We cannot do it ourselves. So, so don't go home today and say, okay, here, from this point on, I'm going to do this. You desperately need Jesus in your life to be able to do that. Be real. Here's the second thing I would tell you to do. Brag about Jesus. Brag about Jesus. That, that was the mistake of Joshua's generation. The, the, they had experienced all of these great miracles. And, and how is it? Here's what the text says. The text says that there rose up a generation that didn't know God's work. How is it that they had kids and grandkids that didn't know the Red Sea story? How is it that they had kids and grandkids that didn't know the manna story? How is it that they had kids and grandkids that didn't know that Moses went up in the mountain and he came down and his face shone? How did they not know that? The only reason they didn't know it is because evidently these parents didn't pass on that truth to their kids. So, So mom and dads, let me encourage you, brag about Jesus. Your kids need to be told over and over and over again the great things that God has done in your life. Whenever God answers a prayer, write it down, celebrate it, tell your kids about it. Brag about Jesus. They not only need to hear from the pastor that God is awesome, that God is omniscient, uh, omniscient, that God is omnipotent. They need to experience it in their life. It must become real for them. I'd give you a third thing. Belong to a faith family. Here's what I'm saying. God has not designed parents. He's not designed you and me to be the primary disciplers of our family. He hasn't done that he, he, he didn't intend for us to be all alone. He has given us a local community of faith that will help us and support us and come alongside of us and encourage us and echo in our kids' minds what we are teaching at home. So, so, so let, me, let, let, let me pause right there and say this. Moms and dads, catch this. The most important thing that you can do for your kids, priority number one, more important than anything else, is to lead them to have a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what that necessitates? That you and I have that type of relationship because we can't pass on to our kids what we ourselves are not experiencing. So, The second thing that I wrote down is this. First of all, as parents, that's got to be our number one priority. But the next thing I wrote down is this. As a church, we must make reaching the next generation a priority. Not only should it be a priority in your home and mine, but but it should be a priority in our church. And, And I want you to know that at Hollywood Community Church, we are committed to doing that. So that leads me to the second thing that I wrote down in my notes, and I'm just kind of tagging along here, follow along. The second thing I wrote down is this. To live generously means to treat the next generation as more significant than your generation. To treat the next generation as more significant than our generation. Remember, Paul made that statement twice in Philippians chapter 2. In verse 3, he said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count what? Count others as more significant than yourself. So here's what he could say. He'd say, listen, don't do anything out of selfish ambition, but count the next generation as more significant than yours. We read verse 21 just a few moments ago where Paul says, for all seek their own interests, not the interest of Jesus Christ. So so church, here's what I'm saying. In order to reach the next generation, we have to let them know that they are important to us. We have to let them know that they are more important. Reaching them for Jesus Christ is more important than our own worship needs. Reaching them for Jesus Christ is more important than our traditions. I'm not talking about biblical doctrines, but it's more important than our traditions. We must reach out to them with 
intentionality. We must go after them. We must strive to reach them for Jesus Christ. So let me give you four ways that that we can do that, all right? Very practically. The first is this. We must understand them. How many times have you said, I've said it, I don't know how many times, oh my, this younger generation, I just can't understand them, all right? We've all said that or thought that, those of us that are in my generation. It's difficult for us to understand them. Why is that? Because they're different. They're different than us. Let me just talk just a little bit about the the younger generation. I know some of them are here, and so we have millennials and we have Gen Zers here in our congregation, and so let me just speak on behalf for them. These aren't all inclusive things, but to a certain degree, they're, they're characteristics of the younger generation. The millennials, we've heard that term. The millennials are also known as Generation Y. By the way, uh, boomers, we're known as Generation X. And so the millennials are, are Generation Y, but the main term that's used are millennials. They, they generally were born from 1980, the early 1980s, to the early 2000s. And so millennials today would be in their late teens, 20s, maybe dipping just a little bit into their 30s. Here's some characteristics of millennials. They're, they're tolerant of differences. Millennials are very confident in their abilities. They are well-educated, and they frequently switch careers. They say today for millennials, it's not anything new for a, for a millennial to switch careers between seven and ten times in his lifetime because they're looking for the best opportunity, and so they're willing to take risks. They're willing to step out and even switch careers. Millennials are by far the least likely demographic in our culture to attend church. Only two in 10 millennials in our culture, in the United States of America, a Christian country, only two in 10 millennials believe that attending church is important. 20% of them. Here's the statistic I want you to see because this hits home. 59% of millennials who grew up in church 59% of millennials whose moms and dads were believers who went to Sunday school when they were kids that sang all the Sunday school songs, 59% of millennials who grew up in church have dropped out of church. They're not in church. 59%. We're losing them at an astronomical rate. 35% of millennials have an anti-church stance, believing that the church does more harm than it does good. I say that because in order for us to reach them, we must understand them. The generation that's coming after them are the Generation Z, the Gen Zers. The Gen Zers were born sometime after the year 2000. They are fully adept at modern technology. As a matter of fact, the Gen Z, or they might be 12 or 13 years old, they can do far more with your computer, your iPad, or your phone than you ever dream of doing. They are unbelievably adept at technology. Someone said it this way, that they, uh, that they will create a document on their school computer, they'll do research on their phone or tablet while taking notes on a notepad and finish in front of the television with a laptop FaceTiming their friend at the exact same time. All right, uh, I am so... Uh, I can't even have music going while I'm reading, all right? I I, I can't, it's disrupting to me, but, but, but Gen Zers are able to multitask. They're able to have all of these things coming at them at one moment, and it doesn't distract them. They are very visual, and they want to be visually motivated and visually challenged. That's who they are. And so, church, in order for us to reach them, we must understand them. The second thing I would say is this. In order for us to reach them, we must listen to them. It's easy for us to discount what younger folks are saying. We have more experience than they do, right? That's what we say. We have more education than they do. What do they know? 
It's important for us to do like James says. In James chapter one, verse 17, he says this, let every man be what? Quick to hear. And I'm afraid when it comes to a younger generation that we are slow to hear, excuse me, we're slow to hear, but we're quick to judge. And we must be willing to listen to them. We must involve them. They want to be involved. They want to do something. They just don't want to sit on the sidelines. The the boomer generation, those of us, I mean, we love coming to a class and taking notes and, and learning and all of that. The, the younger generation, even though they're not opposed to that, they want to be involved. They want to do something. They want to use their gifts and abilities. They want to be able to do something that counts, that makes a difference. So here at HCC, we are constantly looking for ways to get them involved. I love how how Stephen is involving our our younger adults in our worship team. That's intentional. Evan is involving our younger adults in our sound team. That is intentional. Jaquetzi is looking to involve younger adults in our children's ministry. That's intentional. We want them to know that they have value. And we want them to know that this is their church, not just our church church. And the fourth thing I would say is this, we must empower them. That, that's what's happening in the text that we read here in Philippians chapter 2. If you don't know the demographics, Paul is the aged apostle. We can debate how old Paul is. Paul is the aged apostle, and Timothy is his younger son. So, so Timothy's the young buck that's coming behind Paul. And uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you recognized the endorsement that Paul gives to Timothy in this passage. I'm sure the Philippians sat back and thought, but wait a second, Paul, we want you. We want you to minister to us. And Paul says over and over again, you know Timothy's proven worth. This man is like a son to me. There is no one who is more genuinely concerned about your worth than Timothy. So here's what Paul is telling the Philippian church. Listen to him. Allow him to minister to you. Allow him to be used of God to impact your life. Paul was taking a chance on Timothy. But Paul entrusted Timothy with leadership. He promoted him to his followers. And he gave him an opportunity not just to serve, but he gave him an opportunity to lead, which I think is so powerful. So so if we're going to reach millennials and Generation Z with the gospel, we must be willing to do the exact same thing with them. We must be willing to empower them. And all of our young adults that are here today, You know, if you consider yourself in that age group, and if you look around the auditorium, I'm not going to have them stand because I don't want to embarrass them, and I don't want to embarrass us for how few of them are here. But I want you to know that you are very important to us, and we want to reach you. We want to listen to you. We want to involve you. We want to empower you to use your gifts and abilities for Jesus Christ. And we want you to know that you are an important part of Hollywood Community Church. We want you to know that. So let me ask you a very personal question today. Personal question, it's in your outline. The personal question is this, what would you be willing to sacrifice to reach your kids or your grandkids for Christ? I've spoken to many of you in our auditorium, in our congregation, whose kids are not in church, grandkids not in church. You certainly have a burden for them. You want to. You want them to have a relationship with Christ. What, what would you be willing to sacrifice to reach them for Christ, for them to become passionate followers of Jesus? I mentioned three things that it's going to take for us to be able to do that. Okay, first of all, it's going to require change. It's going to require change. Now, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying 
We're not going to change the message. We're not going to change what we preach. We're not going to change what we teach. Culture changes, but God's word never changes. Amen. We all understand that. We're not talking about changing the message at all. We believe the message never changes. We are talking at times about changing the method. So I know what you're thinking. You're sitting back thinking, okay, Brian, so tell me, what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know what that means. I don't know. We don't have a game plan yet. I'm not exactly sure. I do know several things. Our goal is to be missional. We don't want to be uh, attractional. I mean, I realize that we could have, you know, trapeze artists in here and we would fill up this auditorium every single week. And our goal is not just to fill the auditorium. Our goal is to make disciples. I get that. Our goal is to be biblical, yet we want to be relevant. We want to be relevant with our culture. Our goal is to be intergenerational. Our goal isn't to have an auditorium filled with 45-year-olds and up, but our goal is also not to have an auditorium filled with 18 and 19-year-olds. We want to have a multi-generational church, a church where, where, where grandparents worship with grandkids, a church where young worship with old. One, one church that is doing this calls their worship service, they call it their family worship table, is what they say. They say, just as when you sit around the table, all of the generations sit around the table, we want to have a worship experience in which all of the generations are sitting around the table that we're having young and old worshiping together, lifting their hands in the air and worshiping Jesus Christ and passionately serving him. That's what we desire. One writer said it this way, and, and he's just blunt. He says this, an intergenerational worship would be a congregation of diverse ages sitting in a worship service of mixed styles that displeases absolutely everyone. In other words, here's what it means. It it means that every Sunday, the worship experience might not speak to you the whole worship experience. But our goal is to have aspects of our service that speak to you, but our goal is also to have aspects of our service that speak to 16, 17, and 18-year-olds as well. We want them to know that they are important. It'll require change, and I gotta be done It'll require mentors. It'll require mentors. This is so very important. The younger generation needs to connect with older generations. It is unhealthy for generations not to be connected. So we're in need of mentors. Men and women who'd say, you know what, okay, I'm gonna step up and do that. I wanna love on middle school kids. I want to love on high school kids. I'm willing to do that. Here's a couple things we need. Stephen would tell you, right now, we would love to have two middle-aged couples, two middle-aged couples that say, I want to work in the youth group right now. Right now, we have tons of youth workers, but they're all millennials or somewhere around that. We need middle-aged couples that'll say, you know what? I want to invest my life in the lives of those kids. We're looking for mentors to be able to get into our schools and tutor and build relationships. Dr. Hill and I have spoken. There's a sign-up sheet. I know we did it once before. We weren't ready, but we're ready now. There's a sign-up sheet. If you would love to mentor a student at Hollywood Christian School, we have all kinds of kids that come from from single mom homes that need a dad and everything. If you'd be willing to do that, God can use you to impact our generation. There's a sign-up sheet at the school table in the back. I'd encourage you to sign up for that, and Dr. Hill will contact you this week. But there's one last thing, and, and I'm done. In order for this to happen, it's going to require prayer. We're going to have to really pray, and we're going to have to really seek God's face, because at the end of the day, it's not our programs, it's not flashing lights, it's not something else that reaches the next generation for Christ. It is the Holy Spirit of God. And the only way that is going to happen is when you and I become burdened and we cry out asking for the empowerment, a revival of the Holy Spirit of God to do this in the hearts of the next generation. I read this week the story of Susanna Wesley. 
You maybe never heard of her. Susanna Wesley was a, was a mom who understood the importance of praying for her kids. She made a promise to God that she would pray for her kids two hours a day. You say, Brian, what lady in her right mind has two hours a day to be able to pray for her kids? Listen, Susanna Wesley was busier than you. She had 19 kids. Nine of her kids died. She had 19 kids. She milked cows. She tended a garden. She managed the household. And yet she prayed two hours a day for her kids. You say, Brian, did it make a difference? You tell me, two of her sons were John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, the Methodist Church. And they say that those two young men alone were responsible for reaching more than 1.5 million people for Jesus Christ. How did they become the men that God wanted them to be? That a mom who spent hours on her knees before God, begging God for her kids. Mark Batterson, the, the author of the Prayer Circle book, says this, if you determine to circle your children in prayer, you will shape their destinies and your prayers will live on in their lives long after you die. Just imagine what God could do for your kids if you prayed two hours a day for their salvation, mom and dad. Imagine what God could do for your kids if you prayed two hours a day for their sanctification. If you prayed two hours a day for their purity. It's gonna happen through prayer. When we become men and women of prayer praying for our kids, John said this, in 3 John verse three, he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. No greater joy. John didn't say I have no greater joy than to see the trophies in my kid's room for all the sports that he did. Or I have no greater joy than uh, for my child to get this college scholarship. Obviously speaking generically, but he said I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. Generous living, treating others more significant than ourselves is gonna enable us to make a difference in our community. To do so, we've gotta be unified, we've gotta be humble, we have to be on mission, and we have to realize that others are more significant, more important than us. And church, if we do that, there's no limit to what God can accomplish through us. Amen.